Hey, how's it going everyone? Welcome to another video and today we're going to be talking about how to tackle the system design interview. Now, if you have an on-site interview, you are most likely going to be having one interview dedicated to the system design interview. Now, this is an interview where they really want to see you take control of the conversation. They're going to ask you to design some sort of system and this is kind of where a lot of people get stuck because they don't really know how to approach the problem. They don't really know how to um, kind of what steps they should take. And, and it's a really hard interview to study for just because of how many different directions the interview can go in. Now, we don't have an interviewer ourselves, so we're going to have to make some assumptions, but we're going to do our best to simulate a real interview. And the example that I'm going to use is actually going to be from an interview that uh, an interview question that I got myself. Now the problem is going to be designing Twitter. And this is a problem that I got last year when I was interviewing at Zillow. It was the first of four interviews and it was actually with the hiring manager. So without further ado, let's take a look at the roadmap. All right, so as I mentioned, we're gonna be designing Twitter. Uh, initially, we're gonna look at the requirements and goals. So what are we actually building here? What do we want the outcome of it to be? And then number two is gonna be storage and network capacity. How much space do we estimate our system to to require and as well as how much network uh, is going to be going through our system number three is going to be system apis what kind of data is our system going to be consuming number four is going to be a high level design so how is are the components in our system going to be working with each other and finally we're going to get into the database schema and data modeling also i forgot to mention we're going to be tackling a couple more advanced topics, which are gonna be data sharding as well as caching. So in the first part, we need to define our requirements and our goals because we need to know what we're building before we actually go in and build it. So this is gonna be split up in two parts, functional and non-functional requirements. So for our functional requirements, we want a user to be able to post tweets, follow other users, favorite tweets, and also be able to have a timeline, which will be generated off of the tweets that the user follows. So for non-functional requirements, these are gonna differ as in, they're not actual actions that the user can do, but they're requirements that we want the system to have. So the first thing is we want the system to be highly available. This means that basically at any time in the day, a user should be able to go on and they should be able to access their tweets. We want the system to have low latency, so we don't want it to take forever for them to load up their timeline or go to their profile page. We are okay with our consistency taking a hit. So say a user posts a tweet, we don't need it to immediately be available to all users. Um, it's okay if this takes a few seconds. Now, when you're writing these requirements down, don't expect to be able to implement all of these within your interview. Um, you wanna really write as much as you can down just to show the interviewer that you are thinking about these things. So I would say it's better to have more requirements um, that you probably won't get into than not having enough. So that's requirements and goals. Let's go to the next section. So in the next section, we're gonna be talking about storage and network capacity. Obviously, Twitter is a massive platform. So for this part, we're gonna to have to just make some general assumptions. So let's assume that our platform has 1 billion users. We have 200 million daily active users. We have 100 million tweets per day, and we have an average of 200 followers per person. So let's measure our storage that we'll need for our tweets. So if we have 100 million tweets, and let's say each tweet is going to be 140 characters, and we'll assume that it's two bytes per character. So it's gonna be 100 million times 280 and we also need let's say about 30 bytes to store things like id timestamp user id etc so let's give us additional 30 bytes there so this is going to be about 30 gigabytes that we need per day so if we want to multiply that by 365 30 times 365 this is gonna be about 11 terabytes per day, sorry, per year. And then if we wanna multiply that by five, we're gonna need 55 terabytes of data for five years for just our tweets. Um, when you think about it, it when, if you think about it, that's really not that bad for a company like Twitter, 55 terabytes, it's really uh, pretty small actually. So in terms of what our bandwidth is gonna be, let's assume that we have 10 billion tweet views per day. So for that, what we need to do is we need to multiply 10 billion 
times however many characters we have, or however many bytes we have. Remember, we have 140 characters, 280 bytes. And then let's divide it by the number of seconds in a day. So that's going to be 86,400 seconds per day, which if we add it up, or if we do this calculation here, it's going to be about 32 megabytes of throughput per second. So that's something that we're going to be needing to think about uh, later down the line if we want to scale our app. All right, this takes us to our next section, which is going to be system APIs. So once we finalize the requirements, it's always a good idea to define the system APIs. And these should explicitly state what is expected from the system. Um, and we can use either SOAP or REST to expose the functionality of our service. So one example of an API call would be a tweet, and this would be a post, and it's going to take in three arguments. So the first is going to be the developer key, so we can keep track of who's actually making uh, this call. We can have the tweet data, which is going to be something like, probably like the 140 characters of what the actual tweet is. And then we can send in something else like the location of the user that is sending the tweet. And what this would return is going to be a URL of the new tweet. Another API call we have is also called tweet, and this is going to be a get. It's again, it's going to have that key, and it's also going to have the ID of a tweet. And what that's going to do is return information about the tweet, and you could have it return in a format of your choice. I chose JSON in this case. So that covers the system API section. This is definitely something that if you are comfortable with APIs, this is something that you might want to go more into detail with, um, but it's definitely something that should be discussed during the interview. All right, so getting into the fun part now, we're actually gonna be drawing our system and we're gonna be drawing all the different components and how they're gonna work with each other. So initially we're gonna have our client on the left. So this could be something that's coming in from the web browser. We have our server, which is gonna be consuming the um, API call from the client. And it's gonna be saving to a database. And I also wrote this file storage here, uh, just in case if you know some tweets can have uh, pictures a video, so we need a place to store that as well. But the problem here is, um, as like we talked about scaling before, one server is not gonna be able to handle all the, the load that is gonna be coming in from our clients. So what we can do here is have a load balancer between our client and server. So what I've done here is implemented a load balancer. We've also replicated our servers into a server cluster here. So now when traffic comes in from the client, it's initially gonna go to a load balancer, balancer which is going to distribute the traffic between the different servers. So that way, instead of everything going into one server, now it's going to be split up in between three servers. So that way our, our system will be able to uh, better handle that uh, high traffic. So in the next section, we're going to be talking about our database schema and how we're going to be modeling our data. So we need to be able to store data about users, their tweets, uh, their favorites, as well as the people they follow. So for this, I'm thinking that we're gonna use four different tables here. So for our tweet, we wanna have the ID of the tweet, which is gonna be our primary key. We wanna have the user of who is actually creating the tweet. Uh, we wanna store the latitude and longitude. We wanna store the create date, and we want to store the number of times this particular tweet has been favorited. The next table is going to be our user table. So we want to have, again, have the primary key of the ID. And then in here, um, just kind of things that I thought of were the name, the email, the date of birth, and the last time they logged in. So the next table here is going to be user follow, and it only has two values, user one and user two. Since following is only, it's not bi-directional, so it's not like Facebook where if you guys are friends, you guys are friends of each other. Uh, if you follow someone, that person doesn't necessarily follow you back. That's why we only need user one and user two. And this is going to assume that user one is following user two. So if we have something in here that was like, say, user 10 and user 20, this is assuming that 10 is following 20. And finally, we have our favorites table. And this is, again, going to take uh, two fields here. It's going to be the tweet ID and the user or the ID of the user who liked the tweet. Now, at this point, the interviewer obviously could ask you more questions about this. Um, in past interviews, I've actually had interviewers ask me to do certain queries based on these tables. So uh, if you are kind of weak at SQL or you need to brush up on it, I highly suggest you do that because uh, you may be asked to actually do some kind of 
um, gets or, or, or joins based on these, these tables here. All right, so the next section here is gonna be more of an advanced topic. Um, since we know we're gonna have a huge number of new tweets every day and we're, our read load is really heavy, um, we need to find a way to distribute our data onto multiple machines so that we can read and write efficiently. Now, there are a few ways to shard your data, and this is basically splitting your data up onto different machines. So the first technique is going to be sharding it based on user ID. So say we have, say we split our database up into two sections, and say we want everything from like A to M on this database and everything from N to Z here. So in this method, um, we would have our server here, and then we'd have again some kind of like load balancer in here that would uh, that the server would go to initially, and this would route it based on the appropriate database. Uh, another thing we can do is shard based on the tweet ID. So we can have some kind of hash function here. Um, so basically it'll be like some kind of box and the ID would come in here and that way it would know which database it's stored on. So this would be some kind of hash function. And then here, uh, based on the hash function, we can like mod it by the number of servers, or sorry, the number of databases. And then based on that, it would go to the appropriate database. A couple other things just to go over quickly is we can shard based on the creation time of the tweet. Um, that way, uh, it gives us an advantage when we're fetching the top tweets quickly because we know that the top, the uh, you know, the top ones are going to be the most recent ones. Um, we can do things like combine the tweet ID and the tweet creation time there. So there, there are different, definitely different ways that you can shard your data, and it just kind of depends on the trade-offs and and kind of like what applies better to your system. So the final section that we're going to go over is caching. Now, as we see in this diagram here, we have our app servers here, and they are talking to our database. To speed this up, we what we can do is cache our hot tweets and our hot users. So there are different types of real world um, caching that you can use. They're like memcache that can say do something like, let's say, store the whole tweet of the object. So what we can do is the application servers, before they hit the database, they can actually quickly check the cache and see if there's a desired tweet in there. Now this caching is going to live in memory, so it's going to be a lot quicker to retrieve than going all the way to the database. This is why this is the use of a cache. However, we can't store everything in the database in cache, obviously. So we need a way to figure out what we want to actually store there. So basically how it would work is the app server would first check the cache to see if it has what it needs. Um, if it does, then great. It can just send it back to the app server. Otherwise, uh, if there's a cache miss, then it would actually have to go to the database, get the record there, update the cache, and then send it back to the app server. So once our cache gets full and we need to update our cache, we need a way to kick out the old data in the cache. Now, one way of doing this is using an LRU or a least recently used algorithm. Basically, we'll have timestamps of, say we have, for example, we have like four tweets in here. Um, once we get a new one, we'll just look at whatever the oldest one is, say one, it's been in there the longest. Um, then we'll just basically kick this guy out and say the tweet that we got uh, we'll just label that as like tweet five. That way, the next time we need to kick something out, we would go again, look at the two, and then we would kick that out. So it's basically based on whatever's recently been used. Uh, another thing we can do here, if you want our cache to be a little bit smarter, is we can do something, we can call it like an 80-20 rule. Um, say that 20% of our tweets generate 80% of our traffic. Um, so say you have something like a celebrity and they are their tweets are obviously going to be read a lot more than just the average person. Um, so what we can do is we can have an algorithm that keeps those tweets in the cache longer than regular tweets. Obviously, there are several ways that you can go about the cache, and these are a couple options here that, that you could demonstrate in your interview. All right, and that's going to do it for this video. Um, as I mentioned, these system design interview problems, uh, they definitely take a lot of practice. Um, like I said, they're hard to study for. Um, if you have a friend, I highly recommend you guys test each other. Um, there are also a lot of online platforms that let you do system design interviews as a, like a mock interview. But yeah, honestly, like they say, practice makes perfect and that's really the only way of getting better at it. 
Um, I highly recommend you use this system. Um, you know, try designing other things on your own, maybe something like an Instagram or Uber. You'll see that they're all pretty similar in certain aspects. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be all. Uh, please like and subscribe. Uh, it definitely helps uh, grow the channel and, and you know, have this video, helps this video get shown to more people, um, which is what we're all about here. You know, we all wanna get better um, and definitely share the knowledge. So that's going to be all for this video and I will see you guys next time.